The, the one is going to talk about beyond the feed wedge, a 12-month approach to setting key grassland targets for determining appropriate stocking rates and calving dates for op optimum growth. How, really how you actually maximise uh, and optimise the, uh, the grass root system. Okay, thank you Mr Chairman. Uh, good morning everybody. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, the, the organisers of the conference for inviting me to speak here today and also to Brendan who did a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of preparing the paper and so on. Um, I have a tough act to follow now coming after John so I'm just, I suppose I'll have to speak a little bit slower also so people can understand but uh, we'll take it nice and easy. Yeah, look, at the, the, the really the purpose of this presentation, um, as Mike put it to us, was feed budgeting um, for, the, for the 12 month period. So I know when we talk about feed budgeting, I know in my own mind, the things that will spring to mind will be budgets, wedges, all that sort of stuff. And that does come into it. But I want to also take the sort of long term view of it. Um, and John touched on it in his presentation as well. We'll see the whole farm view. So I want to look at it from a strategic point of view and a tactical point of view. Uh, as well as that, looking at the, the targets, the key targets uh, for your own um, farm and for your own business and what they are. Um, a little bit on autumn and spring uh, grass management. Uh, again, John, uh, uh, he would have covered some of the spring stuff, so we'll just sort of re reiterate that and a few conclusions. So, in my mind, when I'm thinking about budgeting, this is the way I like to sort of split it down. So you've got, on the left-hand side of the screen, you've got the strategic elements, and on the right-hand side, you've got the tactical. So the long-term, uh, big-picture view versus the short-term, week-to-week view. I suppose it's fair to say that we spend most of our time as farmers in here, in this tactical part. So weekly budgets, how much ration do I have to feed? What's my pre-grazing yield? What's the post-grazing height? All that sort of stuff. Um, and we will cover that at, you know, towards the, the second half of the presentation. The big part, or the, the bit I want to cover first really, is the, the strategic part here. So, you know, how much grass are you producing on the farm? Stocking rate, supplementation, calving date, those sort of big questions. Um, just, I suppose, as an observation, I would say, in, in the last 12 months, it's probably fair to say that quota has insulated us quite a bit from the strategic part. And the reason I say that is that we were limited on the number of cows for most of us we could carry. Um, going forward, this is going to be more and more important. Um, and I think we have to put a, a fair deal of thought into it. Um, just noticing from talking to farmers the last 12 months, I'd say it's kind of by chance, actually, that this has happened in 2015. So the stock and rate you carry for a lot of you was how many cows happened to calve on that year. So what I'm saying is a little bit of thought pre, pre um, the start of the year and setting the, your strategy up correctly. The last little point from this slide is just that the two are linked together. What you decide strategically is going to dictate what happens on a week-to-week -week or day-to-day -day basis. So if you decide to drive stock and rate to a very high level, it's going to impact your grazing season length and so on. So the two have to match up and they have to make sense. Look, you've all seen this slide a thousand times before. Uh, it's just to, I suppose, reiterate the point. Look, we know that stock and rate, or the, sorry, grass utilization has a big effect on um, profitability on grass farms in Ireland and the UK. So basically, the guys up here, like Chinook, that are utilizing that whatever, 10, 12 tons of pasture per hectare, they're the people who are making more profit. Now, there's also that uh, link between stock and rate and grass utilization. So if you drive stock and rate up, you're going to utilize more grass. That does happen, we'll say, at research level. At farm level, it doesn't always happen. We'll cover that now in a minute. This little table at the bottom, it's a useful little table. And it's basically saying the basic point from this is your decisions around how many cows to carry should be linked to how much grass you're growing. Now, again, you've all seen this table, but from talking to a lot of you, you ignore it. You say, well, you know, it's a bit different for me because I've got an outside block or I've got whatever. But it actually is, this is from good research data from a number of countries, and it's showing that if you want a resilient system, so... Fiona talked earlier about the fluctuations in milk price. And that's what this is all based around, is resilience. A system that will survive at low prices as well as high prices. 
um, you need to be in this range. So we've highlighted this sort of half ton, half ton of supplement per cow. There's a little bit of confusion about that. That's not a half ton of concentrate, that's a half ton of total uh, feed coming in. That also includes winter feed. So again, we're talking about the 12 month period. We're not just talking about the grazing season. <clears throat> now, if you ignore that, if you say, look, that's theoretical, it doesn't really matter on my farm, I'm going to drive stock and rate on anyway because that's, that's what I want to do. There's two, one of two things will happen, or possibly a combination of both. The first is that you will have to bring in more feed onto the platform. Okay, so if you drive the stock and rate past what your farm can carry, you're going to have to bring in more supplement. The second thing that can possibly happen, which we'll look at the next slide, is if you decide, look, I won't bring in the supplement, but I'll still drive the stock and red past what I can grow, what will happen is milk production efficiency will drop. But this is the first one. This is just looking at, looking at supplementation in, in a system, we'll say. This is from, we've done a lot of studies uh, in Moor Park over the last number of years looking at this, looking at different levels of uh, feed imports into the system. Now, just to explain this graph, Along the bottom here, what you've got is the percentage of the, f of the total feed budget that's coming from outside the farm gate. That's also, as I said, including winter feed in whatever uh, guise that comes in. So you've got systems down here that are important, on this side, important 50, 40, 50% 50 of the total feed budget. So that's very high, intense uh, stock and rate systems. Would be quite common in Northern Ireland and England as well. Um, Back to Shinnock probably lies over here, producing 90% of the feed from what inside the farm gates. What it's showing us is, if you look at the lines then, is at different milk prices. At a high milk price, that system where you're bringing in quite a lot of feed onto the platform, you can actually achieve similar uh, net profit per hectare. The problem is that if milk price drops, to, and this is base milk price, drops to 29 or again down to 24, it has a severe impact on your profit. So I suppose at low milk prices, feeds have sufficiency, that's the critical thing. Um, the, the point at the bottom is, as I said, you know, higher stocking rates, that's fair enough, but it can't come at the expense of this. You still need to have, you need to be producing 80%, I'd say nearly as a minimum, of your total feed budget from within the farm. The second thing that can possibly happen, uh, as I said, if you drive stocking rate up, you don't grow any more grass um, and you don't bring in the supplements. What's going to happen? Basically what will happen is you will actually utilise more pasture. So this is New Zealand work. So the percentage, this is the percentage of the total pasture that's utilised running across. So as the system becomes more and more intensive, you're going to utilise more and more of the pasture, which, yeah, that's a positive thing, but only to a point. Because if you overstep the runway, if you go too far, what's going to happen is this line here, the bottom line, is milk production efficiency. So basically, if you think about the total amount of feed on the farm, the amount of that that's uh, converted into milk sold um, for, or for sale compared to um, what's used for maintenance is going to be a lot lower. So basically, you're loading on more and more cows, more and more of the total feed energy that's there is going to go to uh, uh, maintenance requirements. So I suppose the message from those two slides is that you want a balance. You need to set up your stock and rate that you're balanced, that you can produce 80, 90 percent of your feed from inside the farm gate, that you're utilizing a high percentage of the pasture, um, but that you're still getting those reasonable per cow performance. So some people are of the notion that per, per cow performance is not important at all. Like we saw from the Shinnock stuff, it is important. We need to be getting that, um, again, John mentioned the figure, 80 percent. Of, of live weight. So 550 kilo cow, she needs to be doing 440, 450 kilos of solids in that range. And that's a good, it's a, it's a nice target to set for ourselves. Now the last point here from a strategic point of view, so we'll say from the long term point, planning point of view, is calving pattern and date. Look at, you all know that the, the pattern story, compact calving, you know, 90% of the people in this room are, are doing it or striving to do it getting that 90% in six weeks. Uh, the figure there at the top, that's Lawrence's figure, every 1% increase in six-week calving rate, the effect that that has on profit, it's eight euros per cow. So 
you multiply that up for a significant number of cows, it's quite a lot of money. But I don't really need to tell you that because most of you are sort of aiming that way. From the point of view or within the context of compact calving systems, um, the choice of mean calving date, and we've done uh, actually a study on this in Bally Hayes and also in, in Moor Park. The choice of mean calving date has a relatively small effect on the, the productivity of the system. So that's Bally Hayes data, but I suppose the, the curtains there was very, very similar uh, in that later calving, basically you get less days in milk, um, you get more milk per cow per day, and you get a very similar uh, milk yield across the lactation. Uh, with slightly less concentrate usage, but the, it's not huge. Like you can see for us, the difference between uh, early and late was about 60 kilos per cow. It's significant, but it's, it's not massive. It's not going to make or break the system. So I suppose what I'm saying here is that recommended mean calving date, somewhere between the 10th, 10th of February to the end of February, depending on the part of the country that you're in, um, and it's, you know, soil type characteristics, all that sort of stuff. But the, the main thing to focus on is the, the calving pattern or the compactness, and I think most of you have, are focusing on that. Now, from the tactical point of view, if we get the strategy right, if we set the farm up that we have got the right stocking rate to, that's, that's well matched to the growth curve, the tactical point, and it's kind of what Kevin is doing every week, it's, it's using what we have properly. So this is just, look at a graph, um, grass growth versus demand, um, and it's showing what we should be using across the year. Now, I might be disagreeing a little bit with what John said in terms of the autumn and spring budget and situation. What I would say is that the wedge, like the title of the paper was Beyond the Wedge. The wedge is really simple to use. Um, it's easy to understand. And I would expect, again, most of you are probably, you would all understand it, and a good proportion of you are using it fairly regular. The budgets, on the other, on the other hand, I think can be simplified down pretty well, and I think they're going to become more and more important in the future. The reason I say that is that if you're at a lower stocking rate, you can actually still achieve your long grazing season and low inputs, you know, and be slightly sloppy about the budget and end of it. I think as stocking rates go up, you're going to have to become more and more disciplined about it. And I don't think it has to be complicated. I think it can be quite simple, actually. So, Look, it's just a plan. It's a plan for the feed supply, the grass supply across the year. Now, I've put up our figures here, or our targets. They may vary slightly from farm to farm, from situation to situation, but that's where we're at. The one thing I'd say is, look, at two ones to focus on is the peak cover in autumn. So, as you start to build cover here in autumn, what peak you get to, um, and the closing cover. That closing cover is, is the big one. That's what dictates what you have, what feed you have available in the spring. I think, it's, I think it's a target that people really haven't started to focus in enough on. It's, it's, it's really, really important. So, as I say, it's going to vary slightly from farm to farm, but the, the targets will be, you know, peak cover somewhere between 11 and 12, 50, 1300, and that closing cover, and we'll cover that in a bit more detail in a couple of slides. This is just figures from pasture-based farms. So for, for uh, our visitors over the water, pasture-based is just, it's, it's the Chagas Moor Park measurement, uh, computer measurement system. Uh, and we've got in figures, we'll say from 2015. There's, I suppose the main point from this is that the, the peak stock and, or the peak, peak cover there at 1,040 is too low. It's too low to achieve what we want to achieve. Probably the reason for that is, or the reason that we're getting away with it is because of lower stocking rates. As I said already, as stocking rate increases, that's going to have to improve. Now, in terms of, I suppose, a couple of key, simple um, autumn grazing targets, and this is the, the back to the very basic stuff. Um, you know, the reason why we're doing it, we know why we're doing it. We want to get more days of grass. And there's a figure there, 180 per cow per day. I just want you to remember that figure for, I'll come back to it in a couple of slides' time. Um, the first thing is achieving that proper closing cover. Uh, that's really, really important. Um, getting a good proportion, 60%, two thirds of the farm grazed off by the, the 1st of November. I'll come back to that. John has covered the residuals well body condition score and avoiding poaching. They're all the simple basic stuff that we all know we should be doing. 
Now, this is basically a picture of a farm at a 600 kilo uh, farm cover, average farm cover. There's two points I want you to take from this slide that's really important. The first point is that if we look at this portion of it here, if you look there, that's the area that's closed before in early October, before the 20th of October. It's a third of the area, but it's probably half the grass that you're going to have next spring. So getting that right is absolutely critical. Where people tend to slip up here is actually at low stocking rates, if peak cover gets too high, and then they just can't get through it quick enough. They end up actually running into um, a long grazing season in the autumn, but they end up running farm cover far too low for spring. So that's the first point. The second point I want to just point out here is forget about the individual paddock, okay? This target of 600 or 650, whatever it is, that's the important thing. That's what's going to set you up for, 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 the, for you know, low inputs next spring. If you're focusing on an individual paddock, oh, that's too high, I don't want to carry that, it's going to have a major impact on that. So it's just one thing, probably as a rough rule of thumb, there's going to be two to three paddocks are going to be higher than you would like to carry in a high stock and rate system. This is just, I suppose, coming back from my own experience in Ballyhays, and there's a couple of little messages I want to take from this. The first message is that, you know, the, the targets that we set out, that's, that's fine, but you have to work out what kind of suits your own farm. So for any of you that don't know, Ballyhays is quite a distance north. It'll be just along the, um, the Northern Irish border. So there is a slight difference in terms of climate. Um, in the initial years of the project, we were using Moor Park figures. So we were saying start closing on the, the 5th of October. What we learned over time is that was just too late. And if we did that, we ended up with far too low of a closing cover. So just to explain, the light green is the cover that we're closing at, and I'll apologise here, this is available cover. And then the dark green is the overwinter growth, what we put on over the winter. So I suppose the first thing was, um, as we started to realise that actually if we want to close at 600, 650, our date is about the 25th of September. So is that 10 days earlier than we'll say in Moor Park? Um, so that was important. The second thing is that we had a fear, I suppose, that look, at if, if we're carrying these heavy covers across, is it going to affect overwinter growth? Actually, the opposite thing happened. We're actually growing more grass over winter now than we were. Now, granted, they, they have been particularly mild winters, so we'll see how that progresses over time. But all I'm saying here is we're tweaking it. We, we got the targets, and then we're tweaking it to, to suit ourselves. Um, the spring grazing, look at... We know why we're doing it. Uh, all those things make sense. It's cheaper, it's high quality. One of the ones um, that probably we don't put enough store on or focus on is conditioning this ward. Getting it set up for the second, third, fourth, fifth rotation. If you do the spring properly, uh, it's going to have a major impact then on how easy and how productive that to manage is going to be and how productive it's going to be. The figure here of the 270, Remember I said to you during the autumn, it's 180 to remember that. The reason, what I kind of want to get across here is that there, there is a trade-off. Uh, if you're trying to extend, we're all trying to extend grazing as much as we possibly can, but if you extend autumn to the point where you're actually eating into the spring grass supply, you're on a losing streak straight away. Um, that's quite common this year, actually, because it's the first year we've been operating no quotas. So what the guys do, we'll milk on, we'll get an extra few weeks milk in the tank, uh, pay a few bills. The problem with it is they've actually, some of them have run covers down to a point where they're going to have to put in a huge amount of feed in the spring. So it stands to reason to, you know, stop, stop when your, your budget tells you to stop. Um, how do we achieve this? I suppose the couple of things, now again John covered the spring rotation plan quite well. Uh, I would say, along with that, I still think you need to be monitoring your far average farm cover at least each week and watching and seeing what's happening um, and reacting in situations where it's, it's dropping off too quick, basically. That's just look at the conditioning element of it, as I said. Um, you know, which of those two swords are going to be easier to manage in the second, third and fourth rotation? I think it's pretty clear. So getting it grazed out tight and well early is going to have a major effect. Now the feed budget, this is where we'll definitely disagree, John. Um, what, we're, look at, what we're saying here, this is looking at basically 
where we're opening up, and the target we've set is sort of 800 to 900 kilos of an average farm cover at, at Calvin Down. Uh, there's two, two lines there, as Bally Hayes and Moor Park. But I suppose the idea is that if you get this right, you're going to be able to uh, minimise the amount of feed inputs that go in during that period of time. Um, and the first rotation, you know, early February extended right out to magic day. So magic day is anywhere from 1st of April to the 15th, depending on where you are in the country. Uh, increasing feed allowances. I suppose one of the, I suppose the common mistake really is that people way over allocate, uh, which is understandable to a degree. They're trying to be kind of the cow just after calving. But what happens then is if you over allocate, you're given far too much uh, paddocks aren't grazed out properly and you're not going to have that nice green leafy sward that we saw on the last slide. So what I'm saying here is that you're, you're setting off it, uh, our figure is 10, 11 kilos and then you're increasing it by 0.75 kilos a, a day. But if you do what John does, that kind of happens, if you know what I mean. Um, so you're, you're basically increasing the intake of the animal right from the day she calves right up to breeding and that's going to have a positive effect on fertility and so on. The rotation plan, look, similar to the autumn plan, it's, the first, it's all about the first third. If you get the first third right, everything else falls into place. Um, so if you see here, these are the, the first paddocks that are grazed, so that first third up to the 1st of March. Um, that's what, what you're going to be going into on the 5th of April or whatever your second rotation begins. If you get that right, as I say, everything else falls into place. Again, it's actually people with spread out calving patterns or low stocking rates that actually struggle to hit that. If you've got a compact calving pattern uh, and a, a reasonably high stocking rate, you'll hit it with no problem whatsoever. So it's the 30% getting up to that 70% and finishing then on the, on the fifth, on your magic day. The last slide here is just in terms of spring nitrogen. Um, Look, there's no debate on it. There's been piles of research done uh, in a range of different locations, in Moor Park, in Grange, in Northern Ireland, and it all shows an excellent response to early nitrogen. The one thing is that obviously it's more susceptible to losses. So there's a couple of things we have to do from that point of view. The first thing is we split the applications. So you all know this, uh, um, using urea early, uh, uh, 23 or half bag of urea per acre in as, as early as you can get out with it. Um, so you're splitting that application to, to it reduces the effect or the chance that you will lose. Um, the second thing is obviously watching the weather because uh, we need two to three uh, dry days after application um, to reduce that impact. The target at the bottom, you know, 70 units nitrogen applied by the 1st of April. The reality is, looking at the pasture-based stuff, very few people reaching that. And there's a bit of nervousness around it. Uh, at high stocking rates, if we're going to, and compact calving patterns, this, it's non-negotiable. We have to get out, and we have to get out early. In conclusion, Chairman, um, basically, I suppose we've split it down in, into two sections. The first section was about the strategy for feeding the, feeding the herd. Uh, if you get that strategy right, so if you get your stocking rate, um, your calving date, your supplementation, if you get all that balance right over time, uh, then it's a matter of getting the tactics right. And the tactics is, you know, good autumn grassland management to set you up for the spring, uh, accurate budgeting, um, and I think if you do that, you'll set yourself up with a very resilient system that will uh, survive if milk prices drop to low levels. So I'll leave it at that, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. The, um, I, uh, perhaps I, I should have said that um, uh, don't let Bally Hayes will say that uh, it's nearly 200 miles north of here and, and the farm would be heavier than will say that uh, Moore Park or, um, or, or um, Chinook. Uh, don't if I might throw the first question at you. Uh, the, um, Johnny goes out and buys a farm in the morning. In terms of some of those strategic things, how would you establish uh, how would you set about establishing the correct stocking rate and calving date for that farm you know, when you're starting from scratch? Yeah, well, Hands up, please. Yeah. I suppose... Sorry. Um, yeah, it, it's a bit difficult at the start, Michael, in that you've got nothing to set yourself on in terms of grass growth rate. The best you can do is 
pick somebody in the area with a similar type farm and base it off that. So, you know, or similar, the other thing is your soil fertility. And probably I would say err on the side of caution, particularly for a setup farm. The last thing you want is to overdo stocking rate and end up bringing in a lot of extra feed. Um, just as a rough rule of thumb, but five ton dry matter per cow is what you need for that sort of 550 kilo cow producing okay. for over 400 kilos of solids. Okay, okay. And the first question, hands up please. The, uh, let's, let's keep them coming. We've, uh, the, um, There's many farmers will say that are um, doing a good job in terms of the feed wedge, but there's lots of farmers could do a much better job in terms of extending, get, getting more out of grass, we'll say, on the shoulder. So particularly if you have questions in that area, I think we'll say would be, uh, we, we'll get the best out of uh, Donal if you ask questions in that area. Yeah, thanks, Sean O'Brien, dairy farmer, uh, for Donal and Kevin. On the nitrogen applications in the spring and, and growing this 15 and a half tonne of grass, you're out with 70 units of uh, nitrogen before the 1st of April. Um, were you going to nitrogen up on top of the slurry as well on, on your trials? I didn't know if, if that was on top of the slurry or not. And with Kevin, is, uh, are you, um, you're obviously in, in derogation. Are you below 220, above 220 for your nitrogen application? And is it hindering your growth to push on further? Um, with, uh, with, the, with the EU directives on nitrogen spreading. One to John, um, on the, the leasing of the farm at 185 an acre, uh, I'd be very happy if I was paying 185 an acre. Um, I presume you're on a five-year um, renewal. It's probably in your budget. You might uh, just speak a little bit about that. Thank you. Yeah, I'll take the first one. Probably, look, I didn't probably explain that as well as I could have uh, in terms of the application. Basically, the first application is 23 units of nitrogen, and that's either you know a half bag of urea per that's acre, okay, or it's two and a half thousand gallons of slurry. Uh, if you take the wedge that I put up there, you'll have about a third of the farm below 500 of a co farm cover. That gets slurry where it can, uh, and then the rest gets the half bag of urea. Uh, when you come on then to sort of 20, 25th of March, you're going with a 40, 40 unit application on you know, a two-thirds of the farm of urea, and then the rest, which would be what you've grazed um, at low covers, will get slurry. And if you add all that up, it'll come to around 70 units. Okay, done with Mary. And Mary Kinson. Um, Donald, in your studies, did you come up with any sort of rotation targets to assist with resilience in autumn management so that people don't accumulate too much cover or don't, or make sure they do accumulate enough cover in October? Yeah, the rotation targets, I suppose the, the peak, peak covers where it can really go wrong or come crashing down, uh, and it is where there's a little bit of, a little bit of play in it. Um, so you can see the targets I put up there was 1,000 at peak, or sorry, 1,100, 11, 1,150 at peak. On a curtains type farm, 1,250 to 1,300 is easily, easily manageable. Um, in terms of the rotation length to achieve that, uh, you're, Really, um, I would. The way we approach it is that we're monitoring the, the grass cover weekly, and that if it's not reaching that, we'll put in supplement. And it's the first sort of from the middle of August through to the middle of September where that where that can happen, which is a quite short period. Um, so rotation length. Look, you're talking about 40 days plus, really, to get those sort of covers on the ground at that time. Yeah. John, John wants to respond to the leasing question. Yeah. The leasing question, uh, the figure is as it is, yes I agree, if, if you can get it to that figure it's good. If you want to adjust any of the figures, the full financials are in there, so if you say, look, I'm, I'm in the situation, I'm paying 250 an acre, you, you can just adjust the figures in there, obviously and it's going to take something off the cash, but if you're using the figures we presented as a sort of a benchmark, you, you, can, you can work with them and see where you are relative to that. And yes, we are a five-year review. We'll be reviewing this year. I'd say current milk prices will be doing our best to hold that rent as it is, but we'll see where it ends up. Okay, Mary. Uh, hiya, Owen Ashton from my uh, county, Cork. Uh, I've got two questions for Donal. Uh, this year, uh, probably a lot of Irish farmers have an Irish farm cover running well over 900, like probably well over 1,000 actually. And I was wondering, is there any kind of recommendations of what to do this spring? And secondly, what about your reapplication this year uh, in the first round in the spring with a lot of grass being carried over? Thanks very much. 
Yeah, um, I think it's, it showed up on the pasture base data that, you know, I think the average was about 750 at closing. So, as you said, it's going to be 900 a thousand. Um, the main piece of advice there is that don't start with the big ones, don't start with the heavy covers. Uh, get in, graze out your 800,000 covers first uh, for the first week or 10 days, get the herd settled in. Um, and then at that point, or maybe within probably two weeks of starting, you can start aiming for those uh, heavier ones. Uh, it's still quite doable. Like I know we would carry we would carry covers of 16, 15, 1600 over, which would end up with 18, 1900, 2000 in spring. If you get them out of there before the 10th or 15th of March, uh, it's not going to have a severe negative impact. Um, so. I suppose the advice there is go go at the low ones for the first couple of weeks. Uh, that also has the effect that you'll get through more ground, which will set you up for the second rotation, and then you can tackle those heavy ones when you've got more cows um, and you've got um, a bigger demand yeah. per cow. Okay. Sorry, I just can't remember the second part of the question. Nitrogen. Do you want to put nitrogen in them? Yeah, yeah, the nitrogen, look at, yes, get it out. Because when the opportunity is there, you get it out. Urea is stable, but it's quite slow acting. So if the ground conditions are good, I would get it on it. It's going to be there, and you're going to get the kick of that in the in the next rotation even. If you, if you say, no, I'll skip it, I won't put it on those heavy ones, I think what could potentially happen is that you may not get out with it, depending on the type of ground that you're working, um, and it actually, those uh, paddocks would be very, very slow to recover for second rotation, and you'd end up with a, a big problem. So we would have that experience of doing it, and even though the neighbours will think I'm mad, I'd say get out with it. Yeah, the, I, I think, sorry, yeah. the thing we have to remember in spring is nitrogen takes somewhere between four and six weeks to work in spring. So you're putting on nitrogen next week or whatever, that really isn't kicking in until the 1st of March. You know, ground conditions are slow, so if you wait, you skip those heavy covers and say, I'm not going to go near them until I graze them, you're going to hit a lag of growth. Totally agree with Donald. You have to go with that half bag of your ear across the whole farm. My standard comment in West Cork is, if you're making so much money that you can afford to go with something more than your ear, other than your ear, more power to you. There are still people out there not using your ear in spring. More power to you. I've rarely heard of a farmer going broke applying fertilizer. I've heard of a lot of them going broke not doing it. At any of them, yeah. And could your hands up for the next questions, please? Thanks, Chairman. Uh, I have a question for Kevin and uh, John, and it's really to do with you know the, one of the key elements of the success in Shinnock is the board, and you know. And what I want to know is, uh, what would you recommend for an ordinary family farm to get a board set up? Uh, who should be on it? And uh, you know, how do you go about finding the suitable people? And the other thing is, should we make a, an allowance in the budget to cover the costs? Thank you. How do you get accountability in the ordinary family farm? Uh, hold people accountable for A, budgeting, and B, making the budgets. Yeah, yeah. First of all, Jim, there was no need to stand up. I could see you and where you were sitting. But <laughs> I've been waiting a long time for that one. Um, um, my, my first practical dairy farming experience, I experienced under Jim Tracy in Rockwell College. So, Jim, a public thank you for that, first of all. Um, yeah, okay, we had a corporate structure there and there was equity partners with money in, so they obviously wanted to be sitting on that board, so let's not go back. It was easier to do it there. You need someone, I would suggest, from outside the family, whether that's your accountant, your, your, your friend, uh, your advisor, you need someone else. You need someone outside of it to be that independent, I would call it awkward voice. Because it's relatively easy, probably, when, time, when times are tougher and milk prices down, to have discipline because you're being forced to have it. Look at Caroline yesterday, what she was saying. If you have someone ringing you up and say you have nowhere to sell your milk next year, that forces you into real discipline. And then if you get a contract, and we didn't ask her yesterday out of politeness, but we can imagine what her contract is for next year, right? Or where we're facing milk price this year, we'll have a discipline. The real challenge, I think, is when milk price goes up, to keep the discipline to start banking that money or taking the money off the table. Jim, you need an outsider, whoever that is. Yeah. Jim, well, I'm giving you suggestions. The accountant, the banker, Dave, I'm available at a massive fee for doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure I, that Kevin say in my ear the Republican or the Publican. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, 
<laughs> yeah. Ednam McHugh, County Westmead. Um, Chinook versus the Greenfields. Um, yeah. Essentially, I think there was 100 cows less in Chinook, and it made 100,000 more there or thereabouts. Mm. What drove that? Lawrence, do you mind if I pull you in on this? Because we do. Yeah, please. Lawrence, and no, 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 no. I, no, I don't know. Lawrence and me did, no, it was more of a brainstorming session without yeah. doing anything really detailed, but we did look at it last week, yeah. And in yeah. fairness, Lawrence is also from Clare and hasn't got a chance to speak yet, so <laughs> I thought, <laughs> thought it was important to pull him in. John has said enough for all of us. Um, so, so basically, we, we're, it's, if, we, it's something we looked at last week very briefly, it's something we're going to go back at. For 2015, the difference, if we scale them both up to the same level, the difference in uh, profit per hectare is about uh, 800 to 850 euros per hectare. We've broken that down into three areas. First area is milk price, and basic milk price that we receive uh, in the Greenfield versus Chinook versus the Carberry, there's about, a, there's about, that accounts for about 30% of the difference in profit, right? So milk price itself. The second one is in, is in, is in output, in, in, in Chinook, uh, output per hectare is about 100 kilos of milk solids higher than Greenfield. That's solely down to grass growth. John talked about the grass growth. Grass growth is higher uh, in, in, in Chinook. I suppose it's not coming from a tillage operation. So that's accounting for another about 40% of the difference in profit, so output. And the third area is down to, and it's, it's, if, you look, if you remember what John said, his livestock sales were 17% of... Um, of his, his output, whereas in, in the Greenfield it's probably closer to 10%. So, and it's, I, I think that's solely down to, to two things. First thing is Kevin, and Kevin's unwillingness to sell um, stock out of the farm at a very low price, but secondly, he's facilitated in Chinook by a farm that has had a lot of residual facilities, like lots of sheds, uh, lots of, uh, I suppose, facilities that were on the farm, whereas the Greenfield there was, it was a completely tillage operation. There was very little facility. There's no facilities there. So the facilities that we've put on are all that's on the farm. And I suppose the Chinook set up, and it, it's, a, it's, it's an important one, that you know, we mightn't put a huge lot of value on these sheds or these facilities that are in these places. But in the Chinook area or the Chinook farm, you're making a return for it. So the, they're the three areas. Um, it's something that we're going to track a lot closer now from uh, over the next couple of years. Um, and I think there is scope that we'll get them uh, closer uh, as time goes on. Yeah, I'd probably make the comment that two points, if anybody's considering setting up a place on, uh, um, the, um, on lease land, the, uh, a, 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 have a look at the price you're going to get, we'll say that, uh, which is outside your control, apart from the first day you locate. And secondly, in many situations, people will be um, converting tillage ground, and we'll say you'd want to price in, we'll say that con after continuous tillage, we'll say the grass growth, in other words, profit potential, it will take at least five or six or seven years to get up to, we'll say that, uh, the kind of levels, we'll say that, uh, of land that has been in grass continuously. We'll take a couple of more questions. And we never answered uh, nitrogen. Yeah. yeah. Um, there was one question there, one of the guys asked, three part question. Um, yes, we are in derogation. We're in the 220 to 250 kilos, and we're spreading up to the limit of 250 kilos of nitrogen. Within soil testing, we can spread up to 1,600 kilos of P, you know, because with soil testing, our indexes have dropped because of the, of the allowances that were given to us the first couple of years. I just want to answer the one about the land lease, about the 185 euro an acre. This company was set up and we'd say, let's, we invested 820,000. All of that has been completely, fully depreciated over the 15 years. So all the milking parlors paid for, all the cubic louses paid for. So when this project is finished, or if it was me personally, I'd be walking away after paying for all these buildings. So I think that adds value per acre to the farm. So. 185 is a low value we are paying while we're leasing it, but it's adding a significant value to the farm the day we walk out the gate. So, okay. yeah. Any last one or two questions? Yeah, down here. Yeah. The um, hands up now because we'll say we're Sorry, just no, just one quick end. one again to Kevin. Yeah. Um, between the, the Greenfield and yourselves, you're saying 7% difference in the stock sales. Will you rear the calves this year? You were on quota last year. Um, the first couple of years we were selling our surplus calves, no, the first couple of years we took our surplus calves to, um, to we'd say, bullying stage or in calf stage. Last two years we sold our surplus heifers, 
to weaning, which my strict answer again, no, we won't do that again. It was too much strain on the labor within the farm while we were doing that. We, were, we, we needed 50 calves ourselves, our heifers. We raised another 60 plus. It puts a lot of strain on the farm staff while calving these 90% of the cows in six weeks and looking after all these heifers, so no, won't do it again. I can't see any problem. <laughs> yeah, John, your land plaque goes off at half past nine, so. <laughs> no, and, and it, it wasn't quarter that was driving it because those heifers were, were, were um, reared on, on milk replacer because we did our adjustment the year before. We went on once a day in August 14 to, uh, to set ourselves up. So they were reared on milk replacer. They were reared because that man was not willing to let heifer calves out at the price he was getting at the time, and he said, let's add value. But it, it put serious stress on the thing. Now, I had to cope with most of that stress because I was the brunt of it. Uh, so I can assure you, anyone out there that are involved in partnerships and farms, like, at some stage, it's just not worth it. You know, it's not all about money, lads. It's not all about money. Have we any last questions yet, yeah, Michael? Yeah, up here in the middle. Yeah, and, and then the last one at the back. So, aha, uh -huh, the, uh, D Dina just up here. Yeah, yeah. Thanks very much, Chairman. Michael Dorn from Mikesford. Um, and I've converted in the last couple of years from a beef situation, uh, followed the Shinnok very closely, also followed the Greenfield very closely, and there's massive lessons been learned from both examples. But I think it's been very reassuring, the Shinnok, for me to follow up because I've converted from a beef situation. Soil fertility is something similar. You know, the, the potential to grow grass very quickly has been there on the farm as well. The costings, I would say, that I have done on my farm for converting is very similar to what they've done on the infrastructure changes and the whole lot. And I think, as Lawrence said, the, the added value of the extra facilities on the shed, the sheds on the farm, but also coming from the beef situation, you also had the stock value that you're actually swapping stock, which is a massive benefit versus the guys coming from a tillage situation. I also have tillage, I've converted some of the tillage ground. It does take that long number of years to be able to grow them onto grass, and I think that's the big difference you know, the grass growing in the green field. We're, I'm on the green field farm once a month, and you can see it. It's starting to come around now, but I think both examples have been massive for myself and others that have converted, been able to show us the blueprint to be able to do it. And I think the work that the guys have done, the work in Moor Park and the work in the green field, has given us the confidence and the strength to do it, but also the reassurance when you stand up in front of people and people say your milk solids in the first year, like, you know, they're... they're um, it's not worth your boiled milk in the cows. I've had people telling me you'd be better off putting a hose of water into the tank like to bump them up or whatever. But the figures from Shinnok have shown like year on year what they're going to do. And maybe Kevin, now that we're in a non-quota situation, you were in it last spring, how much more potential do you see in the herd to drive the milk solids uh, per cow and per hectare over the next number of years? How much left in the system? Um, Extra. Hard question. I don't know, uh, Michael. Um, Look, we've been getting gains every year, quarter restricted us in 14. I, I have been quoted in saying this is our peak year that I think we have reached our potential. I don't know. Maybe there is another 5% of them. I don't know the answer to that. You see, unless we gain it genetically, I don't see any waste in the system. So if we have a close amount of feed in there, and we're utilizing an awful lot of it, or Kevin is utilizing an awful lot of it, I don't see where we're going to get gains until we get more efficient cows. You know, because, we, yes, we can drive out more. Of course we can do 100,000 kilos of milk or whatever, but we're going to have to buy in all that feed. And we know from everything we're hearing here, that is a game then we're just playing like America, and we don't want to end up like America. We're just playing the price of meal versus the price of stuff. Can we grow more grass, If we can increase that circle by growing more grass, yes. So yeah. I said when we started, if we can get to 15 tonne, we're doing a super job. We've done the 15.6. If we can hold the 15.6 in a normal year, with good grass growing here, and drive it on, then we'll do it. But ultimately, I hijacked it off of Donald. Donald's figures there of how you define efficiency is right. Because we are going to get caught up, I think, in a tendency to put on, Donald, too many cows, everyone. Yeah. Yes, we'll carry more cows, but we're going to hit the production per cow. We're going to have marginal cows. Those last cows there are effectively only getting maintenance. We'll graze the places to the floor, but we'll be carrying too many cows. Like, he's the man to ask the questions there on how do we... We have to keep going back and checking that, Donald. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, look, at, it's, a, it's a closed, as you said, it's a closed amount of feed. It's where this extra milk is coming from is going to dictate. So if the lads can grow more grass, of course, but if not, they just need to use what they, yeah. what they have yeah. more efficient. Yeah, well, yeah. This is good now, Michael. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, my crude way, because we, we, like we all talk, we, everyone here has probably done great analysis and have lots of figures, but in practice out there, I don't come across a lot of that. So what you say to farmers is, have you surplus silage left over this year more than you had last year? If you have, there was feed there you could have converted into milk solids by having an extra cow. If you don't have more silage left over, where are you going to feed those extra cows from? That's it. Okay. Produce it first, then put the cows on. Okay, we've one last question, uh, Kevin. Um, yeah, uh, I suppose just to get advice from um, yourselves up there, maybe Lawrence, in terms of uh, putting that a new herd together again, uh, just the cost benefits of, uh, of uh, first calf heifers or, or, or a mature herd. Okay, Lawrence, do you want to have a go at that? Well, we are thinking up a way of <laughs> dealing with them. <laughs> yeah, it's one that we've had a good bit of a um, good bit of discussion over. I'm coming down on the, on the cow side and maybe, they, maybe I don't have to milk them and I don't have to deal with the SEC, it, it, semantic cell count issues. Um, one kind of proviso I think putting on the Chinook numbers, if you look at the milk yields, 265 year one, and if any you can remember 2011, milk price in 2011 was base price at 34, 35 cent litre, it was an excellent year from milk price point of view. If you had an average year in 2011 with that 265 kilos of milk solids, I think you'd be under pressure. So for me, from a cash, cash flow point of view, um, the more heifers you have in the system, the more pressure you're going to be under. Um, now, in the greenfield, we've probably suffered with a higher culling rate uh, and a higher replacement rate since the first year because we brought in cows. Um, but it, you know, it allowed us to get over that uh, first couple of years where cash flow is absolutely vital. And I think um, it's, it's, it's a tough one, but I'd be on the cow side. Yeah, just for the record, we'll say that we've been involved in over the years in a heap of these sort of things, and I'd be totally opposite the view. I, I would budget, we'll say, that based on, we'll say, modest performance the first year, but I still think you'll do far better over the first five years going the heifer route. But that, that's, um, doctors differ. Uh, the, um, yeah, John? Um, it depends on how tight you are financially. And if you're very tight financially, you probably can't afford heifers because you need output the first years. So what I would say, you have to have a rootless policy as regards cell count. Something like a yellow card system. In other words, if she goes down once, she's causing you trouble in cell count, she gets a second chance. If she's still going down, you dry that quarter. You have to be willing to accept a higher colon and do it. Take the upside in the sense of more output, but be rootless on as regards cell count. Because if, if cell count starts spreading through a herd, it's a bit like letting calf and pattern drift. Then you're for years trying to pull it back. And that has all compound effect inside in the farm. So, Michael, it was heartening to say that we did what you would have told us, but we didn't even ask you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, um, it's, um, I, I, unfortunately, we must bring the session to a close. I, and uh, Michael Dorn probably summed up a fair bit of what I would say. I think we're damn lucky, we'll say, to have two superb demonstration farms doing what Johnny resisted there. Simple, robust, grass-based, resilient, low-risk systems, we'll say that, uh, the, and doing exceptionally well, providing a fantastic blueprint, we'll say, for people to do, we'll say that people who go on those systems, you do damn well over time. I, and uh, Do Donald's approach, we'll say that I, I love the, the strategic approach, some of those questions, we'll say that, uh, and the, uh, that paper, I think, should be mandatory reading for anybody. And, you know, in terms of examining your own strategic decisions, calving date, stock and rate, those kind of things, for the grass growth on your farm. I'd ask you to give, uh, show your appreciation for two excellent presenters.